Jujutsu Kaisen has officially ended. But what did it all mean? It's a series that took six years to come to an end, and I don't think there was ever a chapter where it wasn't part of the most divisive manga discussions ever, and I think it's appropriate that the ending is no different. This will vary person to person, but I think the common problem most people are having with this ending is that one, it doesn't provide many answers, and two, it doesn't really have much of a strong meaning behind it. Like, it does have one with Itadori and this criminal and the idea of reforming, but other than that, it's kind of vague with everything else. The other more important themes and questions are left unanswered. Regardless, Jujutsu Kaisen is a series with a lot of high highs and low lows and Honestly, it's just really frustrating. It would be nice to just, you know, call Gigi a bad writer and move on, but bad writers don't write characters like Nanami and Gojo and Gito and Toji and Higurama and Honestly, I could list a few more. Bad writers also don't write arcs like the Hidden Inventory and Shibuya arc, so what is he? Is Nicolas Cage a good or bad actor? That's a question asked in season 5 of Community. I think he's a genius. I mean, he keeps getting hired for some reason, and it's not because of his hair. And similar to asking if Gigi is incredible or hack, the question is gonna drive you insane like some sort of Lovecraftian horror. But I think I'm built different, so I say screw it. Let's delve deeper. I really want to know if Gigi is as great as we think he is, or the biggest fraud in town. And we're gonna do that, starting from the very beginning. Part 1. The Beginning JJK's beginning is not the greatest. I wouldn't say it's bad, but it's at the very least bad at being a beginning, which is to say it's bad at setting things up. It had its moments with Gojo vs Jogo, Itadori and Nanami vs Mojito, and just the general cool vibes of having a more mature shonen series that reminded me of Bleach. But it also suffered by just having way too many characters that were completely surface level. I first got into JJK like most people by watching the first season of the anime, and I remember being really confused when I realized I like Nobara way more because of that cute little ending dance she did than anything she actually did in the anime. That's not to say that she was bad or annoying or anything like that, more than it is to say that she's not even really a character here. Like, what's there is good, it's just rarely ever there. Same thing applies to Megami, who who I just found dull, and Itadori, who I thought never really had the charisma he was clearly intended to have. The big problem here is actually something quite common with JJK, and that's that the series constantly has this pretense of having done the legwork to make these characters interesting in the first place. You can see what I mean with how Gigi handled their first big mission together and Itadori dies. Yeah, it's a cool moment, but these guys barely know each other and it makes their separation feel hollow. I recognize that Gigi didn't want them to know each other very well, but I have to question why? Like, what purpose does splitting them up here do? You could have even had the exact same plot happen, but just have them go on two or three more missions before it, and things would be a lot better. That way we can care about the characters and get excited for them to meet up again. Bleach does this exact same thing. Its first arc is just a series of episodic adventures, and it's great because it helps establish the world, the characters, and their bonds before things blow up. Just to make this clear, I'm not complaining because the series tried to do something different. A lot of people defend criticism like this by saying that we're trying to make the series something it's not, like ordering chocolate ice cream and being upset you didn't get vanilla. I'm not criticizing the story for not being like Bleach, I'm criticizing it because it's obvious what he wanted and I don't think he quite landed it. Like, his only two options were to either make us care about the characters before their separation, or not. You see how that's not really a choice and it's okay to criticize that. But as it is, the story makes every character weaker in the beginning because now it needs to divide the student plotline between Itadori and the other students when they could have been built up together. It's especially frustrating because this isn't a constant with Gigi. I wish I could just boil it down to, oh, he's a hack or he doesn't know how to write characters, but then you see him shine when he writes characters like Nanami and, and Gojo and, you know, the one great student character, Toto. A lot of people wanted more focus on these guys and it's no surprise. They're super charismatic and fun and they feel unique to JJK. If you had to show them anything from season 1 to really illustrate why someone should get into JJK, you're probably going to show them scenes involving any one of those three. And I actually think you can see how frustrated Gigi is with his work at this point as we get into the next few arcs. So let's talk about it. Part 2 the best of shonen. I don't think that it's an exaggeration to say that the Hidden Inventory arc and Shibuya arc are among some of the best arcs in modern shonen. The Hidden Inventory arc is leaps and bounds better than even the previous arc, so much so I have to imagine that Gigi used the hyperbolic time chamber to improve as quickly as he did. The only problem I can call out is that as you're watching it, part of you wishes that this was the main story all along. I watched the anime with people who've never read the manga and 
Oh my god, you should have seen their faces when they realized that they were going back to the modern day plotline and they weren't gonna have Gojo and Gito and Toji anymore. They were so sad. It also doesn't help that while Shibuya is mine and many others' favorite arc, it does basically begin by saying, hey, the one character you loved and is still alive isn't here anymore, have fun with the other boring dudes. Now, I don't think they stay boring, but it's about the perception of getting into the arc. This is why I don't blame my GN for giving Shibuya a 6 out of 10 and describing it as just a slog of action and little else. Now, I disagree with their statement. I dislike seeing action scenes as a separate thing. I think character and action should be linked at all times, and I think Shibuya does such an amazing job with that. However, I totally understand feeling that way when you consider the prior season has a lot of that and spoilers, but future JJK arcs are full of fights for fight's sake. As for this arc though, I think it's just amazing. Shibuya shows Gigi at his best as he blends great action scenes with genuine emotional stakes like Itadori vs Chozo, Jogo vs Sukuna, and Itadori and Toto vs Mahito. The fights are almost always more than just a fight, but even the small events like Itadori vs the Grasshopper are, you know, short and fun enough to justify and not be annoying. The thing that convinced me that Gigi is a lot more than he led on was in Shibuya where he showed his willingness to commit. A shonen series willing to kill off characters, especially ones as beloved as these is super rare and always appreciated. I was heartbroken when Nanami died, but I also recognized that it was the only logical option. I felt his character reached their natural conclusion, and whilst being sudden, it never felt like it was cut short. Same thing with the villains like Jogo and Mahito, who were the real stars of this arc. However, this wasn't always perfectly done, as we can see with Nobara. Yeah, I know she's not dead, we'll talk about that later. For now, let's focus on this. But killing her off is genuinely among the most strange decisions in the series, and probably the worst in Shibuya. Just get a black eye patch, you know, embrace it. Losing an eye is badass. Dude. It's not badass. I have no depth perception! You're gonna hear me say this a lot, so be prepared for it, but Gigi is really, really good at writing an incredible moment. Moments that will make you tear up out of sadness, or joy, or just out of pure hype. But... And this is a big but, he's not very good at setting up or linking any of these moments together. Nobra's death scene in and of itself is amazing. I love this entire sequence a lot. I think it perfectly encapsulates her character, I think the bleakness of it all is chilling, and I think it ends up leading into one of the best fights in the series. Problem is, I have to pretend that Nobara was a character at all to be invested in the first place. I know there are a lot of Nobara fans, but almost all the reasons are surface level things like her having a great cursed ability, a great design and just an amazing voice actor, which she totally does, or it's her being the victim of just the JJK fandom's greatest flaw headcanons. Once again, I'm not trying to hate on her, but I just want more beyond the tip of the iceberg. But yeah, that's all I'll say about her for now because there's a lot more coming. Ultimately though, Shibuya's biggest problem is that it's technically the second season of content, ignoring the fact that the entire first season was really bad at setting these elements up. Every reason I like Itadori's character starts from here, same thing with Megami. Gigi made me feel this way in the midst of a thousand action scenes all happening at once, and it's impressive. He never loses his focus on characters to justify one more fight when it could be really tempting to. But the problem is, he shouldn't have had to make me like the characters in the midst of a thousand action scenes. I should have already liked them, and these moments here should have made me fall in love with them. So funnily enough, Shibuya's biggest problem is that it's too good for what came before it. Every chapter should have been a tearjerker, every moment should have had me holding my breath, but because of the lack of meaningful content in the previous arcs, I just couldn't. Once again, it's a testament to how incredible Gigi is at writing a moment. He either killed or removed every character I loved, and yet, by the end of the arc, I had found a new fondness for Itadori and even some for Megami, and I was really excited to see where it would go next. I wouldn't say the hidden inventory arc or Shibuya are perfect, but they are truly as perfect as JJK can be. Alright, let's move on. Part 3. The Culling there are a lot of people who started claiming that the Culling Games is so much better than Shibuya. They claim it's got better fights, better characters, and just an overall better story. But have they ever considered that uh, they're wrong? Obviously, I'm just joking, I don't actually mean that. Except I kinda do. Uh, Alright, let's just talk about it. The Culling Games is by far the most divisive and bizarre arc I've read in years. The best thing about this arc is actually Megami, but especially Itadori. It no longer feels like we're reading about the boring guys just so we can get to the core ones, it feels like this is the cool table and they're so much more interesting here than they were in all their previous arcs combined. Over and over again, Gigi proves that he takes his criticism to heart and it's just so cool to watch a mangaka improve and slowly unlock their potential. I'm also happy to admit that the Culling Games delivers some of the best fights in the entire series. You've got Megami vs Reggie Star, great name by the way, and Yuto vs 3 Special Grades and winning. It's 
so cool. But it also doesn't stop there. Gigi proves that he's able to write more interesting battles than just some admittedly very cool punchy punch fights. The world wasn't the only thing that changed on September 11th. Oh. Itadori and Higurama can barely be called a fight, but it's without a doubt among my favorite moments in all of JJK. I love the way he sets up this weird, creepy lawyer who's just fallen into a murder spree that he believes is justified, only for the fight to boil down to a trial that's way more satisfying than any punch could have been. In these small, minuscule chapters, he turned Itadori, a character who I'd started to like by this point, and made him a really worthy protagonist. His confession is just heartbreaking because you know that it's not his fault, you know he's as much the victim as the one Sukuna creates, but you also know that if you were in his position, you'd blame yourself just as much as him. Higurama only needed one moment before he became a fan favorite, and it's the greatest example of Gigi's talents with moments. If I ever needed a strong defense for Gigi, if I needed to lawyer up and make my case, I'd flip to these pages and that would absolve him of any claims that he's anything but an incredible writer. But. Everything I've described up to this point is only really half of the story, and that's because the other half is just... bad. Yeah, I don't know how else to put it. It's just bad. Cullen Games may have some of the best moments in the entire series, but it also has by far some of the worst, and you can divide it pretty much by the halfway point of this arc. There are certain moments before this point that I also don't love, especially in my first read. Like, for example, I didn't really like Hikari vs. the Manga Guy and then Kashimo. I remember really disliking this part because I was reading it weekly at this point and I was watching a dude I barely knew fight two people I didn't know at all. Now, on my rereads, I definitely don't mind this as much because at the very least Hikari is cool and it does lead to one of the coolest fights and lines in the series like, did you lose some weight, Panda, and turn up the volume because this is a funeral for the living. That's actually one of the few times Times where the official translations were better, by the way. Now, as for the next part, there are no zero purpose. qualities. Maki vs. Nayo has to be one of the roughest parts in all of JJK, and I straight up just don't get it. Narratively, it only serves to upgrade Maki, and it does such a bad job at that. It's especially annoying because Maki already gets an upgrade in a previous arc. I didn't particularly like that arc, I thought it was rushed and undeserved, but I didn't talk about it because I could at least tell what Gigi was going for there, and it was mostly fine. Here, however, he has Maki fight Nayo as a cursed spirit, which is cool, but then she gets beaten and conveniently finds herself surrounded by a sumo dude and a katana dude, and the joke is that the sumo dude likes sumo, and the katana dude likes katanas. Why? Just... why? Why? Seriously, why? I don't mind gags, I don't mind gag characters, I don't mind gag scenes or whatever the hell, even if it can be, you know, intrusive to the pacing. But then these guys turn out to be important. Why? Quite literally, the entire reason she upgrades is because she conveniently found a guy whose power allowed her to spend however much time she needed to finally become powerful or free, as she puts it. I do not know why Gigi added this in. I do not mean the hyperbolic time chamber but for only sumo thing, I mean I do not know and will never know why I decided to add any of these chapters in at all. Nothing changes with it, it doesn't add to or improve the story in any way, nor does it make me like Maki or anyone else at the very least. You can't even claim it gives Maki an upgrade when before this point in the story, it seemed very clear she had maxed out on her upgrades in her previous arc. It just feels like Gigi wanted to write about Maki and that's great, I love Maki's concept and design, I'd love to get to know her a bit more. But all we ended up getting was a fight and it just slows everything down and is just a complete waste of time. And the worst part is that things don't just stop there. The arc continues to drive itself off a cliff as we get to possibly the most bizarre thing in all of JJK. America. Why? 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 I don't need to comment on this. Honestly, I really don't. You know it's bad, I know it's bad. Gigi clearly knew it was bad because he basically just deleted that plot point as soon as it happened. There is nothing redeemable here, but it honestly does make me a little sad because I feel like you can tell that Gigi is very conflicted about what he should do with his story here. The America plotline clearly feels like a setup to making JJK's world more expansive. Maybe he intended to have the story go global at one point, maybe he intended to create a spin-off story set in America, or maybe he just wanted an indie and God to crush a bunch of American soldiers, which Honestly, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of like that show a lot. It's, it's dope. But yeah, I don't care to criticize things that we all know is bad. I'd rather criticize things with a lot of potential that just clearly didn't hit their mark. 
So let's talk about Yuki and Chozo versus Kenchaku. I'm sad to criticize this because up to this point, this was my favorite fight in all of JJK. If you had to say one thing about Gigi, say he knows how to write action. I love this fight. I love how Gigi shows a character's delusion, and he has some of the sickest moments here like Chozo stretching his limbs by using his blood, him using a destructo disc, and Yuki using a shikigami as a football. I especially love this moment where she's torn apart, but instead of healing, she just keeps hitting. It's like way too cool. But it has one massive problem that hurts it so much, and that's its conclusion. I see a lot of complaints about the convenience of it all, the fact that Kenjaku, who had no idea what Yuki's technique was, somehow had the perfect counter to her ultimate move. It's obviously super convenient but that honestly doesn't really bother me that much don't get me wrong it's incredibly cheap but i also understand that they're not gonna kill off kenjaku by some random side character like that'd be incredibly lame Psst, that was foreshadowing so yeah it's definitely cheap but i'm fine with it because kenjaku is just way too important to kill off but that's not my actual problem. My actual problem is the fact that Gigi completely wasted Yuki's character. I don't care that she died. I care that she died and I don't know anything about her. There's this Reddit post I found whilst I was writing this video and I just want to talk about some points in it to help me make mine. Keep in mind this was written a while back before the series ended and I'm sure they have some different opinions now but that's besides the point. The user starts by saying that we should assess the work of an art piece not by simply disagreeing with the artist but rather critiquing them on what the artist was trying to achieve and I fully agree with that. Too many times do we see people judge work based off what they want rather than what the work is trying to be. If you don't like grim dark fantasy, if you don't want dark morbid stuff in your stories, you probably shouldn't read Berserk. However, they also go on to say this. A lot of readers are stuck asking, what was the point of so-and-so because they accomplished nothing? I'd say the opposite is true. Yuki accomplished a lot, just not within the confines of what this narrative actively values and showcases. They then go on to give examples, and I do agree with them, but I don't think they thought about that last sentence very much because, how do I put this? Who cares what a character accomplishes outside the narrative that they're in? I'm not saying she doesn't do anything, but I can confidently say she does not do enough. All of her impact on the narrative is before the present day story begins, like her mentoring Toto and her conversation with Gito, and I don't consider the latter to be a good thing. I think it's kind of ridiculous that a character as important as Gito, both narratively and emotionally to Gojo and the audience, is partly convinced to go down the route he did based on a character who we never get to know besides a few vague lore bits. I understand that Gito was probably going to do what he did regardless, but why confuse the narrative by playing her up as this super important role, only for her to boil down to one fight? Sure, you can say she did a bit more like stopping the attack in Shibuya and saving Chozo, but anyone could have filled that role in Shibuya, and honestly, you could have just had Chozo get away or even kill him because he's not that important to the story. Now, I want to be clear here and say that I do not believe that a character's value should be determined by their usefulness. I absolutely hate that mentality, I would not like it if Chozo died here. But you know who agrees with that mentality? Gigi. And some of his fans too. You don't agree? That's perfectly fine, I'll explain why I think so later. But now though, let me get into the final thing I do not like about the Culling Games arc. I'm about to end this man's whole career. A lot of discussion is had about whether or not Gigi handled his contract with Itadori and Sukuna very well. How come knocking someone out doesn't count as hurting them? How come the vow to not hurt anyone doesn't include himself? And how come forcefully feeding someone a cursed finger doesn't count as hurting them? Personally, I think it makes enough sense in the context of the story with the only dodgy one being him knocking out Hannah. But regardless, none of this bothered me as much as what came next. Sukuna possessing Megami was cool. It's a big shock, it makes sense, and it's a satisfying payoff to something that was clearly set up a while back. Sukuna going on to kill Megami's sister, however, was a sign that the series was rushing through important story beats for very little value. I'm sure you know what I'm going to say next. I'm going to criticize Gigi for killing off a character that I didn't know at all. I'm also aware of the defense that most JJK fans give to this moment. You don't need to care about Sumaki to care about Megami and the pain he's feeling. And they're totally right. I don't need to care about her to care about Megami. I think something a lot of people fail to consider, however, is that I don't really care about Megami. I know I've been hyping him up, but that's because I was genuinely starting to like him. But 
That's my problem, I was starting to like him. Megami's best moments are on this arc. His character became far more interesting in the short span we had with him here than anything that came before. Problem is, it's not enough. 200 chapters later and I just started to like him as much as I wanted to like him in season 1. I wasn't expecting him to be my favourite character ever, but just someone cool. And just as we end up getting that, his entire character arc, his potential, his connections and his goals are all cut short. So no, I'm not upset that we didn't get to know his sister before she died. I'm upset that it ruined the potential of so many great things. I understand being emotionally invested in something based on another character's emotions. This happened in One Piece with Luffy and Ace. This happened in Tokyo Ghoul with Shirazu and his sister. And funnily enough, this happened in JJK with Itadori and Megami. Yeah, gotcha. I didn't care for Megami when this happened, but I started to really like Itadori and I felt really bad for him. And consequently, I wanted Megami to be turned back just for his sake. And that's what frustrates me about the culling games. The good in this arc is among the best in JJK, maybe even better than Shibuya, but the worst of this arc is truly, truly terrible. Which is why I'm really confused how by the time I got into the final arc of JJK, I was suddenly reading a new height of greatness the series had never achieved before. And I mean that. Part 4. Highs and Lows Gojo vs Sukuna's fight will go down as an immediate classic. The setup is justified as the fight is just magical. I love seeing the height of a magic system and seeing two of the most powerful characters face off against each other will always be one of my all time favourite tropes. My favourite thing about it all has to be the commentary from the other characters as they watch the fight on Fell. Not only does it teach us what's happening, but it makes Gojo and Sukuna even more impressive as you see how far above they are over everyone else. I also love how powerful he makes both of them feel. Whilst Gojo Gojo does lose, it's obvious that he would have won if it weren't for Sukuna possessing Megami and therefore having access to Maharaga. Similarly, Sukuna would have lost against Gojo otherwise, but you see how monstrous he still is as after having faced Gojo, he starts a gauntlet against a dozen people and practically wins. I say that he practically wins because another reason he doesn't actually end up winning has a lot to do with his personality. Sukuna clearly doesn't care that much about killing these guys because to him, it's sports. There are moments where he takes it seriously, but he would have obviously won if he decided to just go all out from the very start. I love it and I think it makes perfect sense. It's also just way more interesting than having a character who only wants to kill. But whilst the fight is truly incredible, especially the duel part, as with all things JJK, it does come with a lot of issues. So let's talk about it. Are you you because you're the strongest? Or are you the strongest because you're you? If going north means becoming someone new, and going south means you return to who you once were. Which direction would you go? And finally, is your idea of having fun leaving your students to fight a monster who probably uses child bones as toothpicks? Well, depending on your answer, you may be Gojo, in which case, I am so sorry your mangaka hates you. When I was reading this part of JJK, I knew that Gojo wasn't going to win for the simple reason that I knew that Itadori needed to face Sukuna and that could only happen if Gojo lost. Now, I was very conflicted whilst reading this fight because I knew that there was no clean way out. Gigi was either going to kill Sukuna, which would ruin Itadori's story, or he was going to kill Gojo, which would ruin Gojo's story. But then we got to the airplane moment, and I know a lot of Gojo fans were really upset, but genuinely I was so excited. This way he was able to have the duel happen, have Gojo be defeated, let Itadori have his moment to shine, and then bring Gojo back for his triumphant return. Except that's not what happened and this moment here is actually his death. I'm just gonna get ahead of this now because I know this may sound like I'm upset because my theory wasn't right, but I honestly don't care about that. Before anyone tries to say, how did you think he survived getting cut in half, have you considered that this is a magical world and the guy in question can literally heal against insane attacks like this? It's an especially stupid question because Gojo got the London special from Toji and managed to use reverse curse technique to heal himself back up. Obviously being cut in half is far more deadly, but not only is Gojo far more powerful now than he was as a teenager, the story literally tells us multiple times that reverse curse technique can be used as long as the brain is intact, which it was. If you still think that's a reach, then how about we look at this, Yuta using Gojo's body, and what do you know, his body is still attached. So just on the surface level, this is already bad. It makes no sense and it's a lame way to kill a character off. He literally got off screened after all. But let's forget that. Let's pretend that Gojo's death makes complete sense there's no flaws in the story. Well, then it's still pretty bad because it completely butchers Gojo's purpose in it. If we look at the present day, Gojo's role throughout is being comic relief, teaching us about the magic system, poorly might I add, getting imprisoned and basically removed from the story, only for him to return and then... 
die? Sure, he does enough damage to Sukuna to make it possible to defeat him, but that's all his character amounts to. He's just a damage dealer. No thematic purpose, no character exploration, no time spent on his passing. All we got was just one narrative goal in hurting Sukuna. His story ends and we don't get any answers to the questions of his strength. We don't get an introspection on the loneliness of being on top. We don't even get any small character moments. Nothing. And you know what's really annoying? All of this could have easily been explored if we had any time with Gojo before his duel. And the funniest part about it all is that Gigi quite literally wrote that gap of time into his story and decided to skip it all anyway. What for you bury me in the cold, cold ground? After Gojo returns and he has his cool entrance and... God bless Gigi, oh my... God, holy hell, all is forgiven, all right. They then agreed to a month of training and I was really excited to get a mini arc that would slow down and allow our characters a moment to bond, except that doesn't happen. Instead, the month long break is skipped entirely and the only time we get to see it are during the very brief moments where they wanna explain the plan. And this actually brings me to the worst thing about all of JJK, something far worse than a couple questionable decisions or wasted characters because it's what I would consider to be the root cause of all of these problems. We all love a good surprise, and stories that can leave us surprised are rare and appreciated. Gigi clearly loves it more than most, and he does a really great job with them. I think about Gojo getting captured, Nanami's death, and whilst I have problems with it, the Enchained moment is really great. I think the biggest surprise is actually the story overall. Everyone went into JJK expecting Sukuna to become like Kurama from Naruto, and, you know, we were all shocked when we saw how wrong we were. But whilst there are great surprises sprinkled throughout the story, there are also some surprises that are just really confusing. There are far too many deaths in the series that simply boil down to shock value. They don't exist to further a narrative or say something about the characters or story. They exist so audiences will go, no way, and no ways are valuable. A good surprise can really enhance a story, but a surprise should not be a replacement for a story. What value does removing Nobra from the story provide? I'm aware that the excuse is wanting to keep it secret from Sukuna, but how is that more valuable than the alternative, which is to develop a character into someone far more interesting? Thing. Because as it stands, her role in the story is somehow even more minor than Gojo's. She literally provided nothing other than being cool, having a fake death, and hitting Sukuna a few times. But once again, that last part is just a narrative thing. Her entire role boils down to doing DPS to Sukuna like he's an MMO raid boss. She has no goal, no thematic importance, no emotional bond to the characters because she was removed before she ever got the chance. The only reason to like her is for the surface level stuff, and for me and many others, that's just not enough. Like, I know Nobra likes shopping because she says that in her introduction and we see it with the shopping bags in the first ED, but the series never takes time to actually explore those likes and passions. There isn't a shopping scene with Nobra that helps us fall in love with her, for instance. And I know people will say things like a shopping scene doesn't matter or it doesn't do anything for the story, but when did stories become a vehicle for narrative and little else? Filler is the hated child of anime fans who grew up with the big three, but now it's wildly thrown around whenever a manga dares to have more than two pages of characters talking. I read stories to immerse myself in the world, the characters, and if it has it, it's magic system. Obviously, narrative is important, but I see narrative as a vehicle for the characters and world, not the other way around. If all I wanted was a plot, I'd just read the Wikipedia summary and move on with my day. This isn't just isolated to Nobra, it's everyone. Yeah, I like Itadori, but I only know him during the high impact moments and little else, but it's those little moments that help me fall in love with the character. I want to love him, but Gigi is only interested in focusing on him when he's useful. Which brings us back to that conversation earlier. <laughs> Gigi has a history of writing out characters as soon as their usefulness has run out, and that's honestly not the worst thing. However, Gigi seems to only consider the value of a character based on their narrative importance and nothing else. Gojo hurt Sukuna enough to make the fight a little more equal, so now he can die, regardless of if his own character arc is complete. With Nobra, he never really gave her much to begin with, so he seems to think it makes up for it by bringing her back just to damage Sukuna a little more. Similar things happen to Chozo, Maki, Yuta, Hikari, Kashimo, Megami, and even his Itadori. Before this, it happened to Yuki and even all of the Kyoto students, including one special man. Why was Toto removed from the story until the very end? I know the excuse is the resonance thing, but one, Toto could have just not worn the tool around Itadori and Sukuna wouldn't be aware, but let's forget that. Let's assume that it just makes perfect sense. How about the fact that it would have been nice to have Toto in the story because he's a really fun character? Seriously, do I need a deeper reason than that? I know that boils down to just 
vibes, but that's kind of my point about stories. They're more than just a narrative checklist and story beats that you just tick off along the way. There's something more to it, either, you know, spiritually or emotionally or both. It's especially weird because Toto's return is right after the death of Chozo, another fan favorite who has the exact same brother gag as Toto. Wouldn't it have been nice to get scenes with them? Or how about Toto with Yuki? And this is what frustrates me about Gigi because I know he's a good writer because I can picture those scenes in my head. I picture them perfectly. And that's because he wrote these characters to be so fun and energetic and they feel alive to some capacity. It's fine if you don't want any of these characters to interact, but it's the fact that he trades all of these possible character interactions and exchanges them for one single surprise. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to delve a little bit deeper because all of the characters I've mentioned so far, every single one of them, still pale in comparison to how badly Gigi handled this character. Do you guys give up? Have you had enough pain? Never! Kenjaku and Takaba's battle might be one of the most interesting moments in all of JJK. I'm sure there were a lot of jokes that just didn't land the same for an English speaker because comedy is especially hard to translate from language to language, but regardless, I genuinely had a massive grin on my face this entire fight. It was so clever and it's moments like this that make Gigi such an interesting mangaka. This was the surprise of all surprises and I'm genuinely so so glad I got to read this. But. This is also how Kenjaku dies. I understand that Kenjaku's goal was just to have fun and he gets that at the end and I really do like that conclusion, but can we maybe question the other elements of the entire thing? I don't mind that he dies by the comedy bit and then getting ambushed, I'm just more confused that this happens against the guy who we do not know. I thought we were all in agreement that Sukuna was never the main villain of Jujutsu Kaisen. Sure, he was the main antagonist a lot of the time, but he was never the main villain. That role was left to Kenjaku. We all love Sukuna, but the thing about him is that he's kind of a wild card. He has no real allegiance, he just does whatever he wants to do, and that's what makes him so much fun. Kenjaku, on the other hand, was the guy with the plan, with the ideas. He's the one that set everything in motion, Sukuna included. Kusakabe quite literally says as much here when he compares Sukuna to a beast, and literally says he'd prefer him over Kenjaku. It's especially weird, because this moment is after Kenjaku dies, and Gigi is still maintaining that he's the actual villain, and... This is how he chooses to end his storyline? It also doesn't help that a massively contributing factor to his death was Takaba of all people. I like Takaba. He's fun. But that's it. He's fun. This is like Eno being a main contributing factor to taking down Sukuna. It's just like... Huh? I get that Yuta lands the final blow, but that also just doesn't make much sense to me, honestly. I get that he defeats Gito in Volume 0, but he didn't have much of a connection with him there, and he has even less of a connection to Kenjaku. There's no catharsis from his death, it's just confusing. And I know I'm not alone in this, I know that a lot of people probably read that entire moment and were like, hey this is a setup to something big, we're probably gonna get some really cool reveal in a bit, and then it turns out, no. Nothing happens from that. Not even Yuta taking Gojo's brain ends up being valuable. Literally nothing happens in it. It's the most useless... It, why? Why did you do this? I don't understand. I don't understand. Man. The worst part is that Kenjaku dies before we get any answers to his characters, like the question of the body and the soul. What did this scene mean when Gito is clearly fighting for control against Kenjaku here? What does it mean for Gojo to see his best friend being puppeteered by a maniac? And I will never not find this insane, but we literally find out that Kenjaku is the main character's mother and the story never ever attempts to explore that. Even once. I know the answers that Gigi provides are that Kenjaku just changed his mind about Itadori and Itadori just doesn't care about his mother, but why even confuse the story in the first place by adding these elements in if you never intended to explore them? Well, I think I know the reason, and it's not a good one. See, I don't read this and think that it's a shock to the system, everything's been flipped upside down, oh my god, we weren't expecting it. I see it as Gigi ending plot point after plot point for no other reason than shock value, and the simple fact that he clearly wanted to end it. So, with that being said, let's end it. Part 5 what did it mean? The final few chapters of JJK are just kind of a mess, honestly. I just found it confusing and 
boring, I guess. One of the annoying parts was how he has this entire post commentary with the characters. It felt like he wrote them to explain and apologize for everything on his behalf, and I don't know, it just felt like a pity party. We also see the main three together, and it's clearly supposed to make us reminisce of the past where they did missions together. You know, the two times. But honestly, the worst thing about it is that I wish I felt something stronger here. I don't believe these guys are friends, rivals, family. I don't believe these guys know anything about each other. I'm aware that some people may defend it as, oh, they're not supposed to, but I just have to ask, why? Like, what does that do for the story other than make them weaker characters? We then see Kenjaku's corpse being paraded around, which is... Alright, man. Yeah, whatever. Sure. I've... I've, I've come to accept it all, whatever, let's move on. The weirdest part of it all was this conversation between Sukuna and Mahito, and it's revealed that Sukuna wanted revenge. Okay, um, I'm still confused by all of this because when was this ever indicated? Now, don't get me wrong, I was one of those guys that thought a flashback was unnecessary, and oftentimes it's just a crutch that a lot of authors overuse, and I was glad to see that Gigi didn't feel the need to do that in his story. But after randomly dropping this piece of knowledge, I feel like we kind of need to explore what that means, and, you know, not in a prequel manga or a light novel, just within the story itself. It just feels like one final reveal that Gigi needed to get in there and it does nothing but confuse the narrative once again. What does it mean? What is his connection to Arame? And why is this being brought up now? He answered a question that no one asked and didn't answer any questions that he himself set up for years. It's baffling and I honestly just have to assume that the middle finger being the last panel was completely intentional. I can't even be mad because it doesn't feel like an ending more than it feels like a setup to a part two. Part of me is still convinced it's coming. Maybe then we can get answers to our questions, characters can get time to develop and we can get an explanation on what the hell happened in the ending. Like seriously, what is Itadori's domain? I'm, I'm, I'm still just, I'm so confused. But yeah, that's my entire breakdown of JJK and I know, Real brief. I wish I felt a stronger emotion one way or another towards this series. I wish I could say that it's amazing and I have no flaws with it, or I could say that I hate it and that it's the worst series ever. Sometimes I feel it's incredible, other times I hate it, and most times I'm just conflicted. I definitely dislike the final arcs more than I like them, but I can never say I dislike JJK and it's really weird. Other shows have done way less bad and I've given up on them, and yet with Gigi, I'm still eagerly awaiting more. There's something special about what he does, something unique in it. Even if I end up hating the results, I love that he's willing to play in ways that few authors are. So yes, Gigi is an incredible writer deserving of great praise, but he also fails in more ways than just straight up bad stories do. Jujutsu Kaisen is a series with a lot of high highs and low lows, and sometimes that varying level of quality can range massively within a chapter itself. I can't say I love his work, but I do love his vision. If he can learn to be more patient, to take his time, and to let go of this obsession with surprises, I think he can make something truly magical next. Hopefully next time he doesn't have to work on a weekly schedule and you know his manga doesn't get leaked like five days beforehand and then people just give their opinion on a, a two paragraph statement and oh god just wait until the chapter drops please it's just how hard is that so is nicholas cage a good or bad actor is gigi a good or bad writer well it turns out that i'm not him i have no answer and i've gone insane i'm a cat i'm a sexy cat but yeah that's everything i wanted to say if you liked the video, please remember to leave a like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. Anyway, guys, thank you. Bye. That was really awkward. Anyway, peace. Bye. So Nicholas Cage is Jesus? Uh, no. But he clearly works in mysterious ways, and maybe that's just his job. And that's why critics can call him a genius or an idiot and be right no matter what. Mm, a demon to some and an angel to others, like a centibite. <laughs>